All right, Andy, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to talk to you about the history of Morris for the past 100 years. How's that? Um, more than that, 120 years. I am broadcasting, quote unquote, uh, from the room that the um, Pullman Morrison Sword first started in, in 2005. This year is our 15th anniversary. Uh, I have been dancing for 40 years and well, let's just get into it. Uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to talk a lot about history and to a certain point and at that, at that point, uh, it'll be a personal history. So we'll go from a rather academic setting to a rather personal setting. And here we go. So Morris Dancing first found me at the University of Chicago as a freshman, uh, proper, properly in UC parlance, a first year student in 1980. During that orientation week, I went with a group of my fellow new students to activities night at Ida Noyes Hall. Uh, they had all kinds of groups there that wanted your membership. One such group was the UC folk dancers who were holding a, very, a contra dance that night to attract members. I stumbled through the dances, never having even heard of contra dancing, since I am a suburban boy, let alone having any prior dance knowledge or experience. After the dance, we had refreshments in the third floor theater. Paul Ford asked the question of the group of the people sitting around having cookies and, and punch, would anybody like to form a Morris team to which I am, uttered the immortal words, what's a Morris team? And the rest of they say is history. And 40 years later, I'm still here. But I am hardly the, fir the first person to fall under the sway of Morris on the south side of Chicago. Uh, as I've learned in my subsequent years of Morris research, the south side, in particular the Hyde Park neighborhood where the University of Chicago is, uh, has been the location for Morris dancing since roughly 1900. And as I said, here's a photo from me of me in 1982 with uh, one of the incarnations of the Chicago Morris team's 19, uh, Wild Onion Morris. But our story kind of starts much further back. Um, the 1890 census, in the 1890 census, Chicago increased its population by 119% in just 10 years and 40% of our population in the city were immigrants. Here's a group of Polish immigrants getting off literally at Ellis Island, uh, most of them bound for Chicago uh, to work in the mills in the stockyards here. Most of them lived in desperate grinding poverty, of course. One of the reformers to try and alleviate the situation of these overcrowded, terrible slums and the conditions they're in was a woman, a social reformer named Jane Adams. And she bought a decrepit mansion on the uh, west side of Chicago called Hall House. It was named after the people who owned it. It was the first settlement house in the United States. The mission of the Hull House was to alleviate poverty and basically settle the immigrants to a US way of life, to the American way of life. And here are, for instance, um, meal, uh, meals for children of factory workers. And one of the things that Hull House believed in, that Hull House settlement workers believed in, and I'm quoting from a book called Bringing Art to Life, Women in the Arts at, Pul at uh, Hull House. Hull House settlement workers saw the value of recreative pleasure for young people doing the monotonous work of modern industry in 1890. Ellen Gate Starr noted, the worst thing about these crowded districts is the fact of there being no private places for dancing. Young people will dance. These people cannot do it in private houses, hence public halls. Why not a place where the amusement could be indulged in innocently and without danger? Hull House began offering dance classes in the evening to accommodate workers who came for both the healthful and social benefits. And here is a May Day uh, Maypole procession with a variety of 
children in their different ethnic costumes. One of the neat things about the Hall House program was that it was uh, designed to accentuate or to celebrate the ethnicity of where the children had come from, the native uh, customs of where the children had come from, and also assimilate them into the United States and US culture. One of the people who became enamored with this concept who joined the Hull House staff was Mary Wood Henman, seen in a rather blurry photo, not unlike you would see a Bigfoot photo. Um, she was born in, in Ohio on Valentine's Day in 1878. In 1894, she moved to the rather posh neighborhood in, this, uh, in Illinois of Kenilworth at the age of 16. By 1898, in other words, when she was 18, she had, danced, she had joined the dance faculty at Hull House and started to set up a series of dance schools throughout the city of Chicago. She basically made a career for the rest of her life out of teaching dance and advocating for uh, dance classes and particularly folk dance around the city of Chicago. So let's see what else I have to say. Hull House settlement workers saw dance as a wholesome alternative to the restless energy of the young. And this is a quote uh, uh, for showing dance halls, gambling dens, and saloons. Folk dance was also taught in the women's gymnastic program as a quote, socially acceptable outlet for women's physical energies. Henman full of, fully absorbed the ethos of Hull House as she was later quoted by Luther Gulick in The Helpful Art of Dancing in 1910, is astonishing to find how many young men and women were given better positions by their employers after attending class for a month or two. Her motto became, let us not teach so much as share. And this works nicely with her a uh, partnership with a man named John Dewey, who is a philosopher and educator, uh, who became a major influence on her life. She met John Dewey through her, through his wife, uh, the educator and philosopher Harriet Shipman Dewey, who also was involved at Hull House. And Dewey convinced Henman to come down to the University of Chicago and develop a program of gymnastic folk and social dancing as part of the curriculum of the Dewey School, which was the University of Chicago Elementary School. The courses were geared from kindergarten through high school and the school eventually merged with the Francis W. Parker School where Henman worked from 1906 to 1919. Dewey's main philosophy was of education was that a school becomes not only a place to gain content knowledge but also a place to learn how to live, which I think is rather nice. So in 1904, Henman, Henman established the Henman School of Gymnastic and Folk Dance in Hyde Park in order to prepare young women for teaching dance in public and settlement schools. Her name began appearing in the society columns. Chicago Daily Tribune, September 18th, 1910. To Miss Mary Wood Henman belongs full credit. Society folk will tell you to the revival and elevation of dancing in Chicago and her work and enthusiasm has placed the ancient art upon a new plane. It was Miss Henman, in fact, who first introduced the classic dance into Chicago society with the result that she now has in her classes, the sons and daughters of nearly every family of prominence in the city. Miss Hinman, however, has gone farther than this and last winter was besought by the mothers to form a class especially for them, a class which, when fully formed, proved the most popular innovation of the social season. This illustration is from uh, the 1916 uh, book by Henman called Gymnastics and Folk Dancing. It was also used, I believe, by Cecil Sharp in his second edition of The Sword Dances of Northern England. I'm sorry for the very um, overexposed and grainy uh, image. That is how it appears in print. Here is the, from the Chicago Maroon, which is the newspaper, oops, sorry. This is the Chicago Maroon. This is the newspaper of the University of Chicago. Unique features for settlement festival. 
among the national dances which have been arranged for the English group by 48 of, the, of Miss Henman's pupils and Irish, Scotch, Finnish, Romanian, Polish, Russian, Greek, and Indian, all danced by natives of their respective countries in native costume and to native music. Here is Miss Henman's dancing class in England. They are doing Nutting Girl, and these are the aforementioned uh, girls in, um, in that demonstration. This is from a Chicago Tribune article. As you can see, is the dance of the day demoralizing? And this is from September 10th, 1910. And Miss Henman and her uh, cohorts believe so, that the dances of the day uh, were demoralizing and particularly the evils of the waltz and things like that. And voila, folk dancing is where we need to return to the wholesome world. Here are two of Henman's pupils from September 18th, 1910. These are her, uh, this is her native costume for the English dancers. Students at the University of Chicago dancing around the Maypole on field day. This is from a photo from 1910 that was also used in her book in 1916. You will notice the men are garbed in all whites. The women are garbed in a long skirt and um, a blouse of the time, a, a shirtwaist blouse and bonnet. Events in society, a group of well-known Southside women are much interested in the entertainment to be given at the Bartlett Gymnasium at the University of Chicago tomorrow evening as a benefit for the university settlement. A group of dances will be given under the supervision of Miss Mary Wood Henman. She has made a close study of folk dances and goes abroad yearly to ferret out the quaint steps of other years and bring them to Chicago. And many of these dances will be given tomorrow evening one number will consist of an old English Morris dance called Laudanum Bunches, and this will be given by six young girls who will wear Morris barrels, bells on their ankles, wreaths of Mayflowers in their hair, and carry handkerchiefs in either hand. Voila, these ladies. The University of Chicago Student Festival, uh, tell you, University of Chicago Student Festival Mary Wood Henman and this Morris movement and this um, folk dance movement that she brought to the University of Chicago was important enough that she was included in the official program for the 25th anniversary of the founding of, this, of the University of Chicago. Here is the opening fest, uh, an article about the opening festivity of the 25th anniversary uh, celebration. Here is the official program. This was given to me by, uh, the stands of this were given to me by Lorraine Brochu of our team. So this is 1916. And part of the celebration was the creation of a Morris jig, a play and a jig. And the chances for the jig, as you can see uh, two thirds of the way down, were revived by Miss Mary Wood Henman and presented by a group of her students. And this is the costumes of that Morris performance, I will call it. Let's see. So in 1913 and uh, Henman and a large group of Americans, including George Baker and Helen Starrell, attended summer school in Stratford, England to learn more about Morris. Henman invited Sharp to visit Chicago to teach and observe her folk dance instruction. Sharp disagreed with Henman's teaching methods, claiming that, quote, I have accepted an engagement offered me by Miss, Mary, by Miss Ward Henman to spend the week April 7th through 14th in Chicago to, take te to teach three classes a day. I have good reason to believe that she has been altering the dances very considerably that we taught her at Stratford. Making them for easier for children is what I believe her excuse. Good heavens. Here's an article from 1915. Cecil Sharp talks of folk song. Mr. Cecil Sharp, the president of the English Folk Dance and Song Society, spent a few days in Chicago recently in grafting in the minds of the city dancers the true and unadulterated princes, principles of the British folk dance. He also spoke at the Little Theater 
some words about English folk song of which he has made particular study. Mr. Sharp told a uh, told of rescuing and folk music, how he and and rather arrogant here, how he and his associates seeking out persons untouched by the onrush of education had entered the workhouses and jotted down the songs of old peasants now living in the parrot. No one under 70, he said, has yielded a song worth the taking. Another 20 years in English music would assuredly have dissolved in sophistication. English children, Mr. Sharp assured his audience, have been contaminated with French and German songs. Uh, Savez-vous planter des choux has been, has placed the, bla uh, the blackberry blossom, has replaced the blackberry blossom. England has sold her wellsprings of music fresh from the soil for Burgundian or plebeian Bach. Now, I believe that Cecil Sharp, with his connection to the British throne, he was, after all, the music teacher of Edward VII's children, was here on a mission from the British government to try and bolster uh, bolster English folk customs and uh, the concept of Englishness in, at this point, neutral America. This is the second year of the First World War, and I believe he has more of an agenda than simply folk testing or folk uh, dancing. So, last summer in England, this is from uh, the Sh Chicago Tribune. Last summer in England, these Morris dances were still danced by the peasants. At Blenheim, just outside of Oxford, a group of peasant men led by Kimber, a bricklayer, were found going through the steps of the old Morris dancers, arrayed as of old in the costumes associated with the dance at the time of John of Gaunt. John of Gaunt. Around their necks were wreaths of wild flowers while bells jingled from their ankles. The bricklayer himself gave to Miss Henman the steps. Um, Mary Wood Henman spent uh, some considerable time learning from uh, William Kember, who this is talking about. William Kember, of course, was musician for the Headington Quarry Morris men and also accompanied Cecil Sharp on his uh, journeys teaching uh, all over England. And he spent some considerable time teaching Mary Wood Henman his steps and his music. Mary Wood Henman had a great deal of influence on other dancing instruction throughout the Midwest. Here's an article from the Cedar Rapids Evening Gazette, January 10th, 1908. Uh, talking about gymnastic dancing and folk dancing in Cedar Rapids in Chicago. And you can see the part of partially highlighted in Chicago, Miss Mary Wood Henman, under whom Miss Putnam studied. In other words, those Henman School of Folk Dancing, here's one of her students who's gone off into the world and is spreading the uh, folk dance gospel. At the University of Chicago itself, Associate Professor Read, and this is from the Chicago Maroon in 1916. Again, the Chicago Maroon is the University of Chicago paper. Associate Professor Reed has announced a class in sword and Morris dancing beginning Tuesday. The class will be conducted by Mr. Boyer, who has had considerable experience in teaching this work. It will not be admitted to freshmen, but only upperclassmen who can transfer at any time during the second week from other physical culture courses. And also, senior students in physical culture have been given an opportunity to join a class in Morris and sword dancing. And uh, so it was an actual honest to goodness course at the University of Chicago. Mary Wynne Henman here uh, during, the sec during the First World War uh, continues her folk dance work. She actually has gone up to the giant training camp at Camp Grant uh, in Rockford and is uh, teaching the soldiers up there as part of their entertainment. Miss Henman comes here under the auspices of the local soldiers entertainment committee with a message on community service for our soldier and sailors learning up there. Mary Wood Henman moves off to Los Angeles. I haven't done an IMDB search on her. I should have done that, but she moves off to Los Angeles in 1928 uh, and becomes 
uh, she wants to uh, choreograph things for movies and she gets into the movie industry. Here, she is uh, choreographing and instructing 40 children who work in motion pictures. This is from the Los Angeles Times, December 30th, 1928, at a party being held for these children. And the hostesses were, this is my favorite part, Edith Lee Hallway, Wave Chalmers, etc. Ayn Rand. I can imagine what a what a joyous party that was. But anyway, these movie star children are learning basically folk dance uh, through Mary Wood Henman and Hollywood. She died in 1952 in California, and um, her archives are, I believe, at the University of Southern California. Oh, Mary Wood Henman is quite a fascinating story in of herself, but that is just basically the beginning of Morris in uh, Chicago. At this very important annual meeting of 1914 of the Women's Club Federation, which was the 12th biennial uh, convention held in Chicago, and a number of major endorsements came out of this club. And the, the resolutions of the meeting of this particular meeting in 1914 of this club, support of the merit system versus the spoil system, the civil service, uh, which was pointedly resolved uh, in the patron patronage laden city of Chicago. So it was very much a, we don't want, we endorse uh, the merit system of civil, you know, civil engagement, not the spoil system, which was an important thing in early 20th century. All women are encouraged to study the causes of war and the achievements of peace. And this is, of course, at the very beginning of the First World War and a solid endorsement of universal suffrage. Amongst this very important and very packed um, agenda of this uh, of this uh, meeting of the women's clubs was uh, a, an appearance by a woman named Josephine V. Brower. According to the Christian Science Monitor, which is here, uh, June 15th, 1914, universal suffrage was given the stamp of approval on Saturday by the General Federation of Women's Clubs. It was an eventful day at the biennial convention what was intended simply to be a consideration of the traditional subjects in clubdom turned out to be a momentous epoch of far-reaching influence throughout the world. Uh, one of the uh, listings of the agenda, Miss Josephine V. Brower, daughter of Jacob Vandenberg Brower, archaeologist and the first woman to introduce Morris Dancing to America, is vice chairman of the Literature and Library Extension Department of the Federation and made a particularly interesting talk on the subject of folklore. In the afternoon, her paper was illustrated by Mrs. Florence M. Brown of London, who has collected over 300 dances as taught uh, all over England. So in addition to a war resolution and a resolution about civic engagement and good government and an endorsement of women's suffrage, there was also a demonstration of Morris and it's important in society. Here is uh, Josephine B. Brower's book called The Morris Dance. And these are the dances that she uh, has in the book. These are all Headington dances, as far as I can tell. Bean Setting, Riggs of Marl, he Shepherd's Hay, Constant Billy, Country to Gardens, How Do You Do Sir, Bluff King Hal, and then a stick dances of Bean Setting, Riggs of Marl, Shepherd's Hay, Constant Billy, um, and then uh, Bluff King Hal, Blue-Eyed Stranger, Laudanum Bunches, Trunkles. So in 1933, going through our history here, uh, the World's Fair at the Century of Progress opened and the Century of Progress International Exposition was uh, held in the city of Chicago from 1933 to 1934. It was called a Century of Progress to uh, basically celebrate the fact that city of Chicago had been around for 100 years. 1833 was the founding of the city of Chicago. The theme of the fair 
was technology, technological innovation, and the motto was science finds, industry applies, man adapts. And basically the fair was noted, was intended that for the world that's, that's still mired in the malaise of the Great Depression, uh, that they would glimpse a happier and not too distant future, uh, a message of hope. One of the things that was in this technological marvel with airplanes and uh, sky, you know, elevators and all kinds of things was England's exhibit, which had in the very center of it a reproduction of the Globe Theater. And of course, in the Globe Theater was Morris, Sword, and Country Dancers performed at an hourly, uh, on an hourly schedule. Here is a photo from the uh, from the uh, Century of Progress. And this is the maple, as you can see in the middle of the street, and people doing country dance of some form. Here's a photo of the old English theater itself. I think we're basically standing right where the maple was or near where the maple is looking uh, at it. In 1938, this is, I'm sorry, this is 1944. Uh, in the height of the Second World War, this is from December 15th, 1944, Morris is still going strong at the University of Chicago. Large strong delighted by Christmas pageant, the lighting achieved its purpose well of lending solemn dignity to the occasion. And the action by the Kings and Shepherds was well carried out. The Morris dance as the adoration of the song was gracefully performed and harmoniously integrated. This is a photo from the University of Chicago Folk Dance Club from 1948. And the mission of this University of Chicago Folk Dance Club was kind of, to me, profound and beautiful. It was trying to recreate and um, keep alive the culture of so many of the countries and cultures that had been devastated by the Second World War, which had ended only three years previously. And this is them doing, I believe, a Headington dance. This is, and I'm, I have no way to know, but I'm supposing this is the folk dance uh, club demonstrating a Bledington dance and an Atterbury dance. And this is the evening celebration, a uh, folk dance, a uh, 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 social dance for everybody. Please note um, the baldrics that the men are wearing. They will show up time and again in the future. But this is from 1948. I give you this bizarre parody uh, from 1956. This is, I'm sorry, 1959. This is from the Chicago Maroon, November 27th, 1959. This is kind of a snarky article that talks that pokes fun at the um, folk dancing ethos that was expressed earlier, and and you know how how it was uh, going to liberate and and um, elevate people and things like that, but it also is blending in it uh, an advertisement for Philip Morris cigarettes. At the very bottom, is the one of the the type of Morris are dancing. You should have seen Philip Morris was Philip a good Morris or et cetera, et cetera. And at the bottom, and speaking of literature in our book, the best selection of cigarettes on the market today comes from Philip Morris. Absolutely bizarre little article. Now we are going to turn to Mr. Edward Stern and I am going to quote him pretty much directly. His narrative about the University of Chicago team Chicago Morris dancers from 1969 to 1971 is extremely detailed. Um, and I quote Ed, the Chicago Morris dancers began in 1969 when Paul Collins' square dance group ended up with far too many men. He morphed the group into the Chicago Morris dancers and gained more women. Needless to say, it was a mixed Morris group. Our kit consisted of white dress shirt and trousers, black belt and shoes and socks, 
red baldrics with red, white, and blue felt rosettes at the cross points, uh, leather bell pads with red, green, and gold ribbons, red ties. Some of us had straw hats decorated with ribbons and or flowers. At some point, we suddenly needed many more baldrics for a May Day event and added light blue sash type baldrics for the new people. So on the right of the original uh, Baldrick switch, I believe are the ones we saw in 1948. On the left of your screen is a uh, person with the light blue Baldrick. The repertoire consisted mostly of Headington, Atterbury, and old CDS style Bampton dances, plus a few miscellaneous things like the Brahms circle dance. We needed a processional, so I choreogra choreographed one to the tune of Bobbing Joe Bampton. At first, this was called a Chicago Processional. It got its own tune in 1972 at a reunion, quote unquote, in Stockton, California, by the then dissipated group. And many Midwest dancers now know this processional by its new name of Soldier O. This is a photo from the Chicago Maroon. Notice the Baldrics again, I believe, are the 1948 Baldrics. Uh, here are the Chicago Morris dancers performing the Brahm Circle Dance in May 1st, 1970. Uh, Howard Johnson, John Dowling, Demi, well, you can read the names as well as I, but here they are around the Maypole. Jim Dowling passed away uh, in 2014, and it was, he was important enough in his life that he chose, or his family chose, to put a photograph of him on the memorial uh, brochure. This was provided to me by Carol Moore. Thank you, Carol. Here is a color photo of Paul Collins in the, in the very front playing the accordion. A very young Ed Stern with the straw hat uh, next to him and dancing uh, around the maple in, I think, the botany quad. Here is their repertoire, what they would have done. Uh, processional to the, Bob, to the tune Bobbing Joe. I touched something I shouldn't have, sorry. Processional to the tune Bobbing Joan, 29th of May, Riggs and Marlowe, uh, Strike It Up Tabor, and then the Circle Dance, Constant Billy, and a Recessional. And here are the dancers. Paul Collins provided me with this photo um, through, actually through Meg uh, Tidolf. And this is a photo of their revival uh, in the Stockton camp in California in 1972. And um, they look great. And that is where the uh, processional soldier all came from. An intriguing little side note, here's an article I found in the Tribune from 1971, Jollification of the Public Through Mary Court, Country and Morris Dancing Juggling and Unicycle Riding will take place at Grant Park. Uh, three nights will, uh, so forth, uh, if you're inclined. By whose plans are doing this? By the Chicago Maskers, a group of 24 musicians, dancers, and other people who have decided to reproduce the most entertaining Renaissance music they can find. They lament the passing of pre-17th century English's, England's town fairs and have decided after obtaining the necessary park permits, see what they can do once again to share such happy moments. So I don't know who the Chicago maskers are. Fascinating. Here's a photo from the Festival of the Arts uh, in 1976 with uh, groups doing Morris, uh, well, I'm sorry, people in Morris kit doing maypole dances. You can see a rather traditional maypole in the center. Uh, this 1976 Festival of the Arts photo. And here's where we stop it being history that I'm reciting to history where I'm describing my own story. I picked this up in 1980, as I said, uh, in 1980, the Chicago team uh, formed as a women's team and a men's team. 
It's one of the few joint teams that I remember uh, ever in Morris in the United States. So here's an article from 1980 from the Chicago Maroon. Uh, this is November 11th, 1980. And there is Erna Vogue, a photo of Erna Lynn Vogue, who was the leader of the women's team. And I think that's me dancing with her. Here's an ad from the Chicago Maroon of October 7th, 1980. Morris dancing is looking, this is a women's Morris team. Remember, it's a joint team. I, I'm amused that it's in the same section as self-hypnosis, yoga, and psychotherapy. Here's a photo of the University of Chicago men's team. And again, that joint team. This is from 1980. It's from spring. Notice the Baldricks. I think they are still the 1948 Baldricks. The men rapidly changed their name to Wild Onion Morris. Chicago, of course, is a corruption of, however you want to say it, of uh, Wild Onion. And that is Pat Ryan in the front, that is in the back, and we're dancing in Oak Park. This is 1981 or so. Here is a brochure, recruiting brochure for, for our nascent team. Uh, I didn't have a phone then, so that 584 number was my parents' number. So if you wanted to join the Morris team, you would talk to my parents and they would convey the message to me somehow. Here's our recruiting uh, brochure. The image of the dancer stolen quite uh, handily by, by ours and many other teams from the uh, Oak Apple Morris in uh, Madison. The brochure itself, uh, where I, the first of my pontificating. This is a photo of Kate Early and uh, a hobby horse, of course, but let me read you a section of uh, Ed's notes here. He mentioned, we also did some longsword and wrapper in the winter. It really started out as Paul's group. Oh boy. Getting ahead of ourselves here. It really started out as Paul's group. Although I shared much of the leadership and teaching with them, besides dancing, Paul also played according for me some. I also did the hobby horse a fair amount, a role which I loved, even though it wore me out more than dancing. And I think, and we can ask Ed, the reason that it wore him out, and when I first joined the Morris in 1980, the, ho the hobby horse dated from the 30s. And the hobby horse was made out of wood, covered in chicken wire, and the chicken wire was covered in plaster. And it was extremely heavy. And that horse lasted about two seasons with uh, the newly revamped 1980 Chicago Morris. And it kind of fell apart in the rain. And uh, the Windy City women, the women's team, created a new horse. And the horse, thankfully, was made out of, and the, this is, of course, the horse you're looking at, the horse was made out of uh, plastic piping and stuffed heads and things. So it was much, much lighter, much more maneuverable. This is Bing the Wonder Horse, make an appearance, uh, Kate Early, making her star appearance um, with the second of Ravenswood's kits. Wild Onion and Fox Valley Morris, uh, well, the team split, the Wild Onion team split. One half stayed uh, at the University of Chicago and was Wild Onion Morris. The second half went off to the Western suburbs and was Fox Valley Morris, and this was centered in the Aurora area. This is a photograph uh, gratefully provided to me by Lisa Glasgow. I, I missed that. Lisa is this individual right here, and I am here with hair. Here is our performance. This is, um, as is the one you saw previously, this is at the British home in Brookfield, and we're about to start a um, Atterbury Dance. Here's our little brochure, which I was happy to find when I was digging through archives preparing for this lecture. Fox Valley Morris folded and everything got back together under 
Ravenswood Morris. This was the original Ravenswood Morris kit. The problem with the raven in the middle of the circle was it wasn't terribly well sewn down. So after a good rain or a sweat, it ended up looking like an anchovy. This became our new kit. And my wife, Linda, at the time, uh, well, not at the time, my wife, Linda, made the rosettes for it. And what she did was pen the ribbon and would take them every day on the L uh, to sew the rosettes and get them up to speed. They were really quite beautiful rosettes. That's the front, one of the few good photos I have of me dancing. This is the back. The raven is, I'm happy to say, well sewn on. You can see the kit is all whites. Here's Linda uh, dancing with Noel Matawi from Ann Arbor Morris. And a photo of us from 1990 dancing at uh, Libertyville, I believe. The next team that I belonged to uh, was uh, the Pullman Morrison Sword. We formed it, as I said, in the room where I'm broadcasting to you from. This photo shows one of our first practices. We're learning Atterbury. The floor uh, is still yet to be redone. The wire, the lights are hanging on wires. The plaster in the ceiling is still falling down. But we had a Morris team and it was going one of the highlights, I think, of my time in Morris, and certainly one of the highlights of my time with Pullman Morris and Sword, was the creation of, well, was the establishment, whatever, of the 2015 ale, which was, I believe, the largest urban ale to ever have been. Um, we had close to 300 dancers in the city of Chicago, and we had an entirely urban ale experience, and I thought it was pretty darn glorious. Here is my particular tour. I have very few photos of it because I was running around doing stuff. But here is a photo of our particular tour crammed into a bar and two sets of Princess Royal, I believe, are being danced. Another thing I'm immensely proud of our group um, in 2016 to celebrate or to commemorate the entry, the centennial of the entry of the United States into the First World War, I gave a lecture on Pullman, the Pullman factory and Pullman complex and its role in the First World War in the Pullman factory itself, which is where we see. And Pullman Morrison Sword acted as a choir. We sang tunes from the First World War that illustrated the various points along the way uh, of our involvement, you know, the sinking of the Lusitania and over there and all that kind of stuff. Jonathan Whittall in the, in the back uh, played incidental music and things that we didn't sing tunes to. So it was very nice. It is good that we're doing this lecture today because normally this day is spent in Pullman in the Pullman House Tour. And it is a huge event, thousands of people coming down to this neighborhood. One of the things that Pullman Morrison Sword used to make money off of every year was opening a hot dog and chili stand, was running a hot dog and chili stand for the visitors to come down. You can see Caroline is wearing a hot dog to try and drum up business. But here's a wonderful photo of the Pullman Orchestra uh, performing at Pullman House Tour, uh, we're dancing in Arcade Park for visitors. This is about, frankly, half of the musicians we have. The other half are hopping around like so. Here's a better photo of Caroline about 55 feet up in the air uh, dancing Bucknell. And I will leave you with this lovely, elegant photo of Miriam Atia of our team as our fool uh, on a May Day morning in Arcade Park. And that, my friends, is a story, uh, both academic, as it were, and personal of Morris in the city of Chicago. I feel like crying now. Yay. That was
was lovely. Wow, thank you, Andy. I think I am going to stop the recording and stop spotlighting Andy, and then we can all uh, clap and ask questions and do things with the recording off. Give me just a moment.